So that that's all the definition part of slope. Like that's everything you need to know about what slope means. The rest of everything that I have is examples to demonstrate all of these different ways that you can use slope because it really is a very big concept, but it's a very important concept. So I'm just starting with objects because this is more real life. You're, you're measuring the steepness, how steep is something. So we've got a hill and then we've got a storm drainage pipe. So um, our slope, the definition that we're going to be looking at here, it is the change in y over the change in x. So that is that is basically we don't have ordered pairs. So you just have to think, well, how how much am I moving in y? How much am I moving in x? You're looking for the distance, basically. So it's the distance in y over the distance in x. So for the hill, you're just literally taking your vertical, which is 300 feet, and then you're dividing it by 1,000 feet. So units are really important when you have real life stuff. So you do need to look at the units because sometimes your answers have units. In this case, our units would cancel feet over feet. So our answer is going to have no units at all. So it would be 300 over 1,000. And this reduces to 3 over 10. So that would be our slope. 3 over 10. Now for a hill, we usually give it in terms of a grade, which is, or like if it was a road, we give it as a grade, which would be a percentage. So 3 over 10 is equal to 0.3, and that is equal to 30%. So if you were to talk about this in terms of a grade, the grade of this hill would be 30%. So it may, usually isn't given in a fractional form when we're talking about hills. We're looking more as a percentage um, just to determine how, how steep this thing is. Now the example on the right, we have a storm drainage pipe. So this in this case, notice it's going down as we move from left to right. So we're going to use a negative here because it's going down. And a negative means you go down as you go left to right. Um, we don't really have like an ordered pair to give us the negative. So you just have to think, am I going up or am I going down? So negative. Um, and our distance in Y is 5 feet. Our distance in X is 80 feet. So in this case, again, we're going to have no units on our answer because the feet are going to cancel out. And then I can reduce 5 over 80. OK, and that will give me, this will be negative, oops, negative 1 over 16. So the slope for the storm drainage pipe is negative 1 over 16. So if you're looking at, well, well, which one is steeper, the hill or the drainage pipe, it's kind of hard to compare when you have fractions. So it's a lot easier to look at these in terms of decimals. So if I just converted 1 over 16 to a decimal, I just literally divide it. That'd be 0 0.0625. And then sometimes your pipes could also be as a grade because you're looking at the grade in the, the ground. And that would be 6.25%, but it's a negative because it's going downhill. But normally when we talk about grades, we don't give the negative because it's not, all you care about is the percentage. <laughs> you don't really care is it a negative or positive number because you know whether you're going down or up. Technically, if we're told to find the slope, you include the negative. But in real life, we just ignore that. So this pipe has a 6.25% grade. So it's smaller than 30%. It's not as steep because it's a smaller number than 30. So the, the hill of 30% is much steeper than that storm drainage pipe of 6.25% if you're comparing the grades. Any questions?
Okay, so here we go. Uh, technically, you know, now we've got an actual grade of the road and it wants to find the slope. So slope we don't normally give as a percentage. Grade is a percentage, 2.5%, but if you're told to find the slope, you're not going to put it into that form. You're going to put it into like a fraction form. So that's where you take, well, what does percent mean? So percent means per cent, and cent comes from 100. So you're dividing by 100. So to turn your grade of the road of 2.5% to a slope, you would have 2.5 over 100. Now we don't write our, our, we don't have fractions with decimals in it. We don't mix decimals and fractions together. So what we need to do is move the decimal place. So you're basically multiplying the top and the bottom by 10 so that you're moving the decimal place over by one. So that way you don't have that decimal. So that would be 25 over 1,000. And then you are reducing that fraction. So 25 goes into 1,000 40 times. So this would be 1 over 40. So if you're asked for the slope, the slope is 1 over 40. And it's positive because you can see the truck is actually going uphill here. So grade is given as a percent. It's literally the same number. It's just we give our answers in different forms. Then on the right, we've got pitch of a roof. So we've got a span of 24 feet, and then the highest point is 7 feet up. So it's going to be the pitch of a roof. You're, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the left side where you're going from A to C or from C to B. One side's positive, one side's negative, because one's going up, one's going down. When we talk about pitch, we usually use the positive version. So we're going to be looking at the left triangle here. And so we've got our height, that change in Y is 7 feet. The span here, you divide it by 2 because it's going to be halfway. So that triangle is going to have 12 feet as our change in X. So to find the, the pitch of a roof to basically give the slope, it's going to be 7 feet over 12 feet. And then the feet cancel because the units cancel, so it's just 7 over 12. And we usually, for pitch of a roof, we give it as a positive number. We don't normally worry about the negative because it's going to be the same in either direction. Are there any questions? Okay. Just as a side note on pitch of a roof, um, many years ago, um, a one of my communications uh, colleagues, she was going to be like building a, a new, I don't know, a shed or something with that. And she wanted a specific pitch of the roof. And she knew like how wide the building was, but she didn't know how high she needed to make it to get that pitch of the roof. So we had to actually use algebra so we could figure out how high she needed it. So if you're wondering where is algebra in real life, she she needed to use algebra there because she needed my help. Because she's like, I know I want the angle, but she needed to be high enough to have snow fall off. And she knew how wide the building was. She just didn't know how high she had to make a roof. So very useful skill there. So these two examples, so these are more, you know, we're moving from the real life example. Now we're looking at actually the formula if you're looking at it as points on an XY plane. So the formula we're using here is the same formula for slope. We're still looking at the change in Y over change of X. But we're looking at the version where you think of it as the difference in the Y values divided by the difference in the X values. Same exact meaning, we're just interpreting it differently. So when you do it this way, you're usually given two ordered pairs. I find it very helpful to label my ordered pairs and my numbers. 
So the first order pairs x1 and y1, and the second one is x2, y2. And we always put the numbers in alphabetical order, so always x goes first and then y. By labeling those, that makes it much easier for me to make sure I plug in the numbers in the correct places. And then it's also easier for you to check your work later. So um, I highly recommend doing that, and I'm just going to automatically do that on the second set of numbers here as well. So then we start, we just use the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So y2 for my first example is 4, not 4, that's x2. <laughs> y2 is 6 minus, and then y1 is negative 8, so we're subtracting a negative 8. So I put a parentheses there because we're subtracting a negative. So that's going to turn into adding. And then in the bottom, we have x2, which is 4, minus x1, which is negative 3. So again, I needed to put parentheses around the negative 3 because we're subtracting a negative there. So I'm just going to move down underneath here. And so we're really going to have 6 minus negative 8, or 6 plus 8, which uh, 14. And then 4 minus negative 3, that's going to be 4 plus 3, which is 7. And then 14 divided by 7 is 2. So there's no units. Our slope is just literally a number 2. It's positive, so that's telling us that if we connected these two points, it's going to go from left to right. Now, the example on the right has fractions, which I know a lot of people hate fractions, but I did one with fractions just because I want to encourage you to not be afraid of fractions and to use technology to do fractions for you. So same formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So y2 is 1 minus, and then y1 is labeled as 6. And then x2 is 5 halves minus x1 is 3 fourths. So 1 minus 6, that's negative 5. That's easy enough. In the bottom, I would recommend using technology to do that for you. So I use Desmos. I use it so often it's <laughs> showing up on my, my thing here. Um, and you're going to want to use the scientific calculator because that's where you're going to be doing the fractions. And so I'm literally going to be doing, let's make this so you can actually see, okay. So I've got 5 halves minus 3 fourths. And then we want to write it as a fraction because if you have, a, if you're given fractions in your ordered pairs, your answer needs to involve fractions. So that's going to give us 7 fourths. So I'm going to write 7 fourths down here. So we have negative 5 divided by 7 fourths. So we're dividing by a fraction with the same, which is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So this is the same thing as negative 5 times 4 over 7. So you can write the negative 5 over 1. So whole numbers can always go over 1. And so you're basically just multiplying across here. So 5 times 4 is 20. We get negative 20 over 7. And then that is how we write our slope. So you're not going to turn it into a decimal or anything. We're leaving it as a fraction. Most slopes, we always leave it as a fraction. Now, if you're even if even that dividing by a fraction kind of freaked you out, we can even do this here. So we can do negative five divided by, and then you can put in parentheses and you can put in your fraction, seven over four. So 
you can even literally do that and then you can see how you get these these decimals and then you can convert it to a fraction so if fractions really freak you out don't worry you can use your scientific calculator here and it can make that easier for you Are there any questions? Okay, so next examples that I have. There's a lot of examples, but there's a lot of stuff that we're, <laughs> a lot of stuff about slope. So here we're giving graphs. So sometimes you're asked to find the slope of lines and you're not given formulas or anything like that. You're given a graph. And so you need to figure out, well, what is the slope? So you can go from two different ways. Um, you can basically build that triangle, especially if you have grids here. Or you can determine two ordered pairs that you see on those lines, and then you can use the formula. So we'll do one of each. So the one on the left here, let's say, and I want to pick numbers that are kind of on the grid because those are easy enough to read. So if I drew my triangle here, my vertical distance of my triangle is one box, or it's one unit because it's between two and three. And then my horizontal distance is two because I, I moved from two to four horizontally there. So if I use my slope formula for the change in y over change in x, then that's literally going to be one over two. And that's my slope. I, we basically went up one and over two. Now the downside of doing the triangle this way is that if it's like going down, you have to remember that your slope should be negative. So you could do the triangle thing on the right. Let's say we use this point and this point and you'd have to think, okay, my change in Y is, it's big, but it's going to be negative. So you would have, an, because you need to have a negative answer on the example on the right because we're going down as we move from left to right. But the alternate way to do that is to read the order pairs. So my first point that I picked here is at 0, 3. And then the second one is at 1, negative 1. So instead of drawing like a triangle, I can use the slope formula where you're given two ordered pairs. I just have to decide which ones I want to use. I just want to pick ones that are easy to see on the graph. So on the right, we'd be using the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 formula. And so it does help to label x1, y1, x2, y2, so that you know what numbers you're plugging in. So y2 is negative 1, and y1 is 3, and then x2 is 1, x1 is 0. So we get negative 1 minus 3, which is negative 4, 1 minus 0 is 1, and we get a slope of negative 4. So if you're asked to find the slope of a line, you can do it by basically drawing a triangle and then looking at your distances, or you can do it by writing the ordered pairs and then using the, the formula where you use the ordered pairs. Either one works. You just want to make sure that you've got the correct sign. If it's going up from left to right, it's positive. If it's going down from left to right, it's negative.
Now to throw in a couple of stinkers here, we've got the horizontal and we've got a vertical line. So these are special cases. And these you're going to want to have your notes somewhere because these are special. A horizontal line always has a slope of zero. So if you think of it, we're changing y over change in x. Our change of y is zero. So it doesn't matter what my change of x is. When I divide, doesn't matter what number is down there. Zero divided by anything is zero. So horizontal line always has a slope of zero. The other one is vertical. We have change in y over change in x. The x is not changing, but the vertical is changing. But it doesn't matter what that number is. Anything divided by zero is undefined. So whether you use a formula or whether you memorize it, horizontal lines have a slope of zero. Vertical lines are undefined. It's always going to be that way. Okay, so now we're going to get into some concept questions here. You know, I'm doing the wide gamut of all the different things you can see with slope to really hit home what slope is. So first, what is the slope of a line perpendicular to the x-axis? So let's draw a picture. So we've got our x-axis. If we're perpendicular to it, that means we're going straight vertically. So if it's perpendicular to the x, it is a vertical line. And we just saw the slope of vertical lines is undefined. So for questions like this, you need to think about, I like to draw pictures. What are they giving me? OK, what does it mean to per perpendicular or parallel? And then what is the slope? Second one here, what is the slope of a line defined by x equals 2? So if I draw my x and y, and x, if all we know is x equals 2, then this is giving me a vertical line through 2. It's telling me where I'm crossing on the x-axis. So this is also another vertical line. And again, the slope is undefined. And you don't even need to really look at the pictures. You can go back to this in your notes. x equals, that's the one on the top right here, x equals a number. That's a vertical line. The slope is undefined. Now this last one here, this is a good one. If the slope of a line is 5 over 8, how much horizontal change will be present for a vertical change in 216 meters? So let's, we've got our slope formula, change in y over change in x. So the slope of the line is 5 eighths. So I can replace m with 5 eighths. And we're saying how much horizontal change. So we're looking for the change in x. And it says our vertical change is 216. So we have a proportion here. We're basically looking for this, um, this part right here. If you want to give it a letter, Instead, of, we can just say, um, let's use H for horizontal. So you just plug it into your slope formula, and now you have an equation that you can solve for H. So to solve something like this, you cross multiply. You multiply your diagonals. So 5 times H equals, and then we multiply 8 times 216. 
Definitely need a calculator for that. 1,728. And then you divide both sides by 5. And it gives us 345.6. So now because it's, it does, it gives us the slope of a line is 5 eighths, you could write your answer as a fraction. But it also gives us units. It says the vertical change is in meters. And because our slope has no units, the horizontal is also in meters. And we usually give meters with decimals. We don't give meters with fractions. So you could, it's totally valid to leave it as a decimal and say 345.6 meters is the horizontal change. And this is essentially what we had to sort of figure out for um, my colleague that was trying to do the pitch of a roof. It's just that we were looking for vertical instead of horizontal. Are there any questions? Okay, so I have, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to skip my next slide and go to this one instead because this one will be quick. Determine the slope of a line parallel and perpendicular to the given line. So here we're going to use our definitions of parallel, parallel lines. Your slopes are equal. So M1 is equal to M2. Perpendicular lines, M1 is equal to the opposite and the reciprocal of M2. They are negative reciprocals. So if we are given a slope of 6 over 7, then the parallel line also has a slope of 6 over 7 because it's the same slope. So if your slope is negative 10, then your parallel line is also negative 10. Let me try to spell that again. Now perpendicular is the opposite sign and the reciprocal. So for a slope of 6 over 7, the perpendicular line is now going to be negative 7 over 6. For a perpendicular line, for m equals negative 10, if you think of that as negative 10 over 1, then the perpendicular line has the opposite sign, so it's going to be positive 1 over 10. So you don't really have to do too much math. You just have to think, OK, am I doing parallel or perpendicular? And then. Um, which kind of formula you're doing. So I've got one more slide that's really important that I want to make sure I get in. And this is an actual a real world problem here. Um, what we have here is real data and then we've taken a line and we've estimated um, basically the relationship using a line. This is called linear regression. This is actually something that's done in statistics. Excel can do this. It's basically taking a whole bunch of data and then trying to get the line that best fits that data, gets as close to the data as possible. You're trying to get it to go through as many pots, points as possible. So the data in the graph below show that the wind speed y, and this is measured in miles per hour, for Hurricane Florence versus the barometric pressure x that's measured in millibars or MB. So it's just telling us that we're graphing as the bar bar barometric pressure increased. As it went to the right, you can see the wind speed decreased as it went down. Hurricane Florence struck North and South Carolina with devastating rain and flooding in 2018. So part A, use the two points indicated to find the estimated slope for the data. So we, our, we've got this line that is going through a lot of the points as close to the points as possible. We're going to use this to estimate the relationship between the pressure and the wind speed. 
And so we're going to find the slope using those two indicated points. We're picking points that are actually on the line because we know for sure those are on those lines. So our slope formula, we're going to use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we can label 946 as x1, 130 as y1, 994 as x2, 70 as y2. So we have y2, 70, minus y1, 130. Then x2, 994, minus x1, 946. So I do my subtraction. It's going to be negative 60 over 994. Minus 946, 48, which then if you were to reduce that fraction, that gives us negative 5 fourths. So that is our estimated slope. And we actually have units for this slope because our units here are not canceling out. Our y's that was measured in wind speed, so that's mile per hour. And then the X, that's our barometric pressure in millibars. So that's MB. So our slope has units because it's going to be miles per hour divided by millibars. That's, that's the units on our slope. Negative 5 fourths miles per hour per millibar. Now it's kind of messy, but those are what our, what our units are there. So part B says interpret the meaning of the slope in the context of the problem. This is the most important part, and this is where people usually make mistakes, but this is the most useful part. So when we're interpreting the meaning of slope, we usually don't want to write it as a fraction. We want to write it in its decimal form. So negative 5 over 4 is negative 1.25. So, um, and I actually just turned on subtitles or something. So <laughs> it's negative 1.25 miles per hour per millibar. That will help us kind of um, help interpret this. So when we write our slope, we usually are describing whether we're increasing or decreasing, and then how much vertically by how much horizontally. And we basically have like a, a, um, a form that we use. So we would say the, and then whatever is on the top of the fraction, so whatever we're measuring, so I'll just kind of put top here. So that is wind speed. That's what we're measuring. That's on the top. And then the next is either decreases or decrease, decrease or increase basically on the sign. So the sign here is negative. So we say decreases. By, and then you have a number and that's your slope, but you ignore the sign and you include the units, 1.25, and then we use the units of the top, miles per hour, because that's wind speed. And then you say per each increase of one, and then you have your x value. So this is the bottom, whoops. And we usually describe it in its units, millibar of, and then pressure, we'll just say pressure. Kind of running out of room here trying to squeeze it in. You could say barometric pressure, 
but we're for each increase, and it's increased here because the x is increasing as we move left to right. So the wind speed is going down as we go left to right, but the barometric pressure is going increasing, going left, uh, going, going up from left to right, and then we include the word on average because it's not exact because if you look at the data, there are some words where it might be, you know, it's not going to be that number for every point of data that we have, but on the average, that's what it is. So that's what interpreting the meaning of context is. So the way we write it is essentially the same. You're just filling in these blanks based off of the numbers you have, the units you have, and then what you're actually measuring, whatever your Y is and your X. So the interpret the meaning, the, this is telling us that the wind speed decreases by 1.25 miles per hour for maybe instead of per, I could write for each. For each increase of one millibar of pressure on average. And if you didn't want to do it this way, you could say we can go back to the fractional form. We can say it decreases by five miles per hour for each increase of four millibars of pressure, but we usually do it in the, the unit form where you divide it out. That's generally how we interpret slope. So you can see where this is sort of giving us rate of change. We're describing how much it changes. As x changes, how much does y change? That's sort of what the interpreting the meaning is. Are there any questions?